religions, backgrounds, cultures, traditions. Not everybody believes in heaven and hell. Not everybody believes in angels. Not every. So it can, if if delivered the wrong way, it could create conflict and division. But I believe we have it packaged in such a manner that the overall me- mission yeah. won't get you know misconstrued. Okay. Yeah. So we'll see. Okay. Yeah. Nice. You ready? Yes, sir. Derricus, are you ready? I know my queen ready because you look ready. I'm hangry. <laughs> All right, let's do it. <clears throat> a cure for a curse. There are many horrible diseases and sicknesses that invade and trespass through our lives each and every day. This current COVID pandemic is a sad yet excellent example of how a virus invokes fear and anxiety because it is an evil that threatens our peace of mind as well as being one that we cannot avoid or currently defend ourselves. There are many contagions, far too many to name, that we have encountered as a human race that have laid claim to many innocent lives that were snatched way before their time of destiny and completion. But tonight, we are here to talk about the virus that whispers from behind the shadows, curses. Similar to viruses, they also can, can, uh, cannot be seen traveling in the air, nor are they visible on the surface of the skin, and no amount of blood work can detect the traces that a curse is even present. They are more threatening than all other diseases because no physician or surgeon can diagnose or provide a remedy for the harmful side effects that a curse delivers. And unlike the most common, you know, the more common diseases we know, curses can lie dormant and hidden from its carrier for years, and some people live their entire lives unaware that they have been carrying a curse at all. So, And are accepting that curses are clearly not something that is of this world. It is best to assume that the prescription to the cure is also not of this world as well. Mm -hmm. Curses are a deadly byproduct of unrighteous decisions. Therefore, the only vaccine available to us to be cured of these silent killers is to combat it by exposing it and injecting ourselves with a righteous posture of living. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about it. We'll start with generational curses. We often don't look at our families unbiasedly until we are either upset, there's conflict, or some behaviors in the family have impacted us directly. Some generational curses that are passed through the bloodline that come to mind are curses of broken marriages, traditions of infidelity, repeated cycles of teenage pregnancies, and deep-rooted drug and alcohol abuse, just to name a few. So my queen... How do you personally view generational curses and how have you addressed any that may have impacted you as a woman? I'm going to let you go first because I'm hangry. I'm going to let you st- <laughs> Y'all, I'm so st- Pray for me because all I'm doing is raw. It's been a long day. And I'm only doing raw. So I've only had broccoli and like a couple of carrots and celery. I'm going to let you set this thing off. Okay. And then get it from there, I'm be like, you know what I mean? I'm going to jump in. All right. <laughs> well. <laughs> Can we be honest? I think they'd rather see you here hangry than not at all because I swear we were that close to being like, uh, next to. I, I said, I was like, we can't yeah. do it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Generational curses. Um, I never knew my father. He never had a tight relationship with his father. Never had a tight relationship with his father. Um, Those are some things that come into a child or a newborn's life that they don't even know about. You don't know why your father, your mother is not there. You you may want to excuse them because their parents weren't there or whatever, but at some point that cycle has to be addressed. And for me, it was a matter of making sure that I was present in Trey's life. You know, this way before we got married. And it was challenging. I could feel that curse on me at times. There were times when I just couldn't move forward with it or times that I got frustrated or times that, you know, I clocked out, you know, dealing with it. Um, But that definitely was a curse that I had to uh, address in in my life with my son. And I definitely know that alcoholism, drug abuse, uh, I'm an 80s baby. So a lot of people around me got uh, impacted by crack. (laughs) And I saw it. You know, I remember those things. My life was impacted by it. Um, so as far as even in my young, young, younger years, even running the streets, just you know how I rock. Like if I have a drink and I have two and I'm cool, I'm backing out. Like you, you're not going to catch me wasted. You're not going to catch me out there making a fool of myself because I'm, 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 I'm very aware of that, that 
that thing in my bloodline that's waiting to cripple me and 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 bring me under to the subjection of addiction and things like that. So a great sense of self control and discipline is how I've been able to combat that in my own personal life. Yeah. Good to like it's good to know those things and like acknowledge those things. For me, I I think I have a double win because I have my mother's side and my father's side. Um, and from my mother's side, I've always been, you know, very open because they've always been very open with sitting me down and letting me know the, you know, my grandmother had her first child at 17. My mother had my oldest brother at 17. I had Zion at 17. My cousin Kima had her first baby. Like that 17 thing was just like, and all of my cousins did not, not end up like I have one cousin. Her name is Khadijah. She's like out of me and Kima. She was like the really smart one. <laughs> She got all great grades, and she was like, you know, she 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 was really dope at what she did. But me and Kima kind of, you know, we went down a path that was a, a bit different, and so our test was different. But we came out with dope testimonies. But it it was so much like my grandmother, and so much like my mother and her mother and my aunt, you know. Um, and then, as far as just finding bad relationship relationships, bad relationships, it was like. Um, brokenness within the father my 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 grandmother um her father stepped out on his family and she was a side child and so she didn't get the love that she felt she should have deserved even though her sisters and her brothers brought her in and loved on her she still had that 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 thing and then my mother her father my grandmother's husband he was an alcoholic and so he was you know, um, he spent most of his time drunk, and he would always call them bitches and hoes. He would always, you know, call them, you know, names. And they grew up with that. And then I feel like my mother would sit and tell me about certain relationships that she would get into, and it, it, that same thing would happen. Is like you're looking for what you see growing up, and you have to break those generational curses. On my father's side, I come from a talented family. Everybody is talented. Everybody sings or plays. And when you grow up in a talented family like that, everybody wants to please and make everybody happy and be the life of the party. And um, I think I kind of took on that role of like, let's just make everybody happy. Let's just please everybody. And then what happens is anxiety comes with that. What happens is, um, you know, your mind, you can't control your mind. You're always thinking, 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 I got to please these people. I got to say yes to these people. I got to make them happy. I got to get on stage. I got to kill, kill, kill. And then when you have a talented family, everybody's kind of like against, everybody's kind of like fighting with each other all the time. Cause Everybody's just so talented, and you got, you're dealing with a bunch of geniuses in one room that this person thinks they knows it better, this person thinks they knows it better, I can do it better, and then you end up with a family that doesn't speak anymore. And so what I'm doing is breaking all of those generations. And I, could, I can name a lot, lot more, but uh, it, you know I'm not trying to put my family on blast, but when I do speak to the younger ones or when I speak to my nieces and nephews, and shout out to all my nieces and nephews. I think I have 22 of them, either 22 or 23. Um, but the one thing I want to let them know is like, you know, hey, it, it, you know, the other day, not mentioning any names, one of our, our babies came to us and was talking to us, and I, I allowed her to know that that's a generational thing you've got to break. The auntie's been breaking off of her life. So you got to start breaking these things off of your life in order to have a healthy relationship, in order to have a healthy business, in order to to be the best mother, the best the best uh, friend, sister, and so on and so on. These are things you got to kind of break off your life and recognize them in your family. And it's not saying you don't have to deal with your family, but once you start recognizing them in your family, then you can start. You you now understand what to pray for. And you now understand how to walk and how to switch up your posture and look at yourself in the mirror every day and say, I will not allow anxiety. I will not allow bipolar. I will not allow you just start claiming all speaking all this stuff and, and dismissing it out of your life so that you won't pass all of those same things down to, to the younger generation. That's just how I believe how I see it. Yeah. And I mean, that's dope. Number one for sharing and, and, and being in a position where you're on the other side of it and can look at it with different eyes. Um, I, I think one of the biggest uh, challenges when it comes to curses in, in general is 
it can it can come off as normal. Yeah. When you when you are used to dysfunction and you are used to chaos and you are used to pain and trauma and rejection and and darkness, <clears throat> when everybody around you is in it, you don't realize it. You may not realize it until you get around another family, or you may play sports and you may go over to your coach's house and you be like, "Yo, this is different. Like y'all actually like each other." Y'all get along. Y'all actually sit at the table. Y'all hug each other. Y'all say, I love you. So sometimes you can be unaware that you are battling a generational curse and you're taking that to school. You're taking it to your job. You're taking it from relationship to relationship because that dysfunctionalism has become a part of your makeup yeah. and it's a part of your identity. So you have to, when you can, exposure is a powerful thing because when you are exposed to other things, you can kind of parallel that to how you live your life and what you do and you have something to compare and contrast it to. Yeah. Um, but I, that's just one thing I wanted to throw out there when I was listening to you talk. Sometimes, again, if your whole family rocks a certain way, like my family rocked a certain way and move a certain way, you don't know that this is not right. It's yeah. the norm until you're either confronted with some new information or you gain exposure and you're able to be in a different atmosphere when you can see something is different. Yeah. And now it was, uh, it, two things came up to my mind. Um, it was kind of like, oh, I'm going to start with this one first. Like, I sit and I watch some of the shows that are on TV about, like, different, you know, um, cultures. And I noticed, you know, we watched the 90 Day Fiance show, and there's a, there's a family on there, and their culture is very, very strong, and they stand on their beliefs, and they were raised up a certain way. And... I feel like part of me was just like, wow, that's kind of dope. Like nobody breaks, nobody, and they catch it before. Like it's like, you, uh, uh, we not even, let's cut it from. But if we go way back, especially as black families, I just want to speak on black families, generationally, like from what we went through, we never really had the time to sit out. And especially our ancestors that came before us, like in the slavery days, they didn't have time to sit down and tell it because they were taking care of other people's children while the children were doing, uh, you see what I'm saying? So it's like, we never really had the time to kind of start from the jump and like set things for our, for our families. We, we, st we still don't, have you noticed like, they have Bart, Bart Mitzvahs, is that how you say it? But as black people, what do we really have traditionally other than people linking up for Christmas and Thanksgiving? We don't really yeah. have anything. Yeah. And so it just made me think, like, it's not like I'm trying to beat up on us. I'm just trying to say that we got to start somewhere where we start breaking those generational curses because it was snatched away from us. Correct. It was totally snatched away from us. They didn't have the time to sit down and say, hey, I want to tell you a story. And I mean, they, I believe they, they were able to tell stories. And, you know, back then they would sing their way through problems. They were, but they didn't really have that time to invest, like, the cultures that I see that are raising them up from a baby and that same thing. So a lot of the genera a lot of stuff is, is, is being caught before it. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and then I wanted to say, too, like, when me and you first got married, when you came into my life, yes, the chaos was like what I was used to, but Kim was almost looking around like, like this is a different world. <laughs> I never we had a Halloween party, and I turned my whole garage into a haunted house. Did you come? Yeah, that I turned insane. it into a haunted. I painted. It was black. I had monsters and creepy crawlers everywhere, I, and the house was full. Like I think we forgot we were even at home. Yeah. But it had gotten so chaotic, and, and, and I had had so much alcohol. And this goes back to my grandfather on my mother's side, because my mother used to tell me, she would say, watch, watch how much you drink. You know your grandfather <laughs> had a problem. I'd be like, Ma, I'm not him. But she was seeing something like, but the way you're going, you know, it, why do you have to drink so much? Like in my younger days, I could drink. I could drink. To the point where you'd be like, how many shots you have? And you're still walking? Those are signs of alcohol. Like, those are signs of a person that can handle alcohol. And you want more. You want more, 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 more. And that night, it just got out of hand. So for Ken, for me, I was used to it. This is how we do it. For Ken, he was not used to that. So that was something I had to fall back. 
and 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 kind of work on and look at myself because that could have broken up my marriage because it was a generational curse that was on my life of go hard or go home, get so drunk till you pass out and you black out. And he's like, queens don't do that. Women don't do that. You don't have to go so hard. So that was one thing in my life that I had to sit back and pay attention to. Like, yeah, I might want to fall back from that because if it takes, you know, and, and just to let y'all know, we didn't prayed about that thing so much, honey. I can't have but two glasses and I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> now I got what is this apple cider or something crap? Yeah, that's some whole foods right there. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, but you know, yeah, but just to like you know tap on what you had said, yeah, we we've lost a lot of tradition. We lost a lot of things as far as heritage because it's very hard to regain or reestablish tradition when you're faced with survival. Yeah. Survival consumes your time. Survival consumes your resources. It consumes your thoughts. Um, and it dictates your 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 atmosphere, but we're not where we should be and will be, but we are in a place right now where this conversation is very on time because we have more knowledge. We have uh, the ability to have different conversations now. You know, it used to be, you know, parents couldn't even bring certain things to their kids. It was like, that's what I said, do as I say, not as I do, don't dot, dot, dot. But now, you know, kids are asking more questions. They're doing more research on their own. So when you see certain patterns in your life that just don't gel and jive with your spirit, it's a great time to address that and figure out how you can go against the grain and combat that with a different level of behavior. When it comes to a curse, there's no hocus pocus nonsense. Now, that's something I don't get into. I believe you can combat just about anything on this earth with a righteous demonstration and a righteous posture. If you get certain things out of your spirit, out of your playlist, out of your VCR, off your laptop, out of your conversation, you could begin to rewrite what your life looks like and put those curses to rest. So, um, words. It appears that we as a people may never fully understand the power of our words. We speak death daily and feel no remorse once it's been spoken or tweeted or commented. And that's because our eyes don't witness an actual physical death taking place. But with words... We kill people's self-confidence. Yeah. We kill their dreams. We kill their hopes. And we kill their sense of security and a sense of belonging. Harsh words spoken by someone who represents the church can even make somebody question God uh -huh. and kill their spiritual walk dead in its tracks. So my queen, mm. what are your thoughts? What are your perspective on curses that are created through the very words that we release into the atmosphere? Mm. It took me a long time, though, to like... <laughs> That's crazy because I was raised up in church. The reason I really want to know your thoughts on it. Grab the mic. I want to know your thought on this. Being raised up in church, right? We are taught that you got to speak life, speak the word, write the vision, make it plain. But <laughs> we really don't. We really don't do that. I'm not saying now. I, I don't. I don't. I'm, I'm in a different place because I'm realizing that there's power in my tongue and, and, and I create my day with the things that I say. Sometimes me and Kendall could be talking to each other and we use the wrong word and we'll correct each other like when God does it, not if God does it, not, you know. Um, but a lot of times when I've been in church, it's like it's good in the moment when everybody's under the anointing and, and, and it feels good in the organist plan, but when we get back home, why is it that suicide is right back on your mind? Or why is it that you're feeling defeated and insecure? You're not feeling like, you know, it, it, it's it's something. You, you get what I'm saying? Yeah, I, it's so funny that I've never been asked this question, but I, I don't know if God just gave me this answer, but it just came it just came so clear. We were taught to do things before we believed them. Okay. Say that again. We didn't even believe. We didn't, we didn't know what we believed as a child. We just went. We were taught a behavior. And I know some people will get mad about this, but it's, but it's the truth. God, is, God is, a, is, is a thing that we believe. And I think what's happening is that when you are taught to do something, you're being trained to do something. And so now you're not even sure if you believe what you've been taught. So now that all the behavior and all the things that we do in church, you still go back home not knowing if you really believe what you, what you were taught to do. Yes. Especially. Just like, Just like racism, you said. That's a fact. Okay. That's for real, because if, 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 if we're taking our kid to church on Bible study, leadership, prayer, so on and so forth, we're, we're, like you said, bro, we're teaching them behaviors. 
the way that they get to see God is in how we demonstrate at the house. Yeah. How we demonstrate, you know, if, if, if you telling me I shouldn't do X, Y, Z, but then Saturday night at the poker game, I'm seeing you cuss, fuss, twerk, whatever the case may be. Then Sunday morning, you getting me up. My spirit is conflicted. Yeah. And kids have the most pure spirit. They have maintained about all this nonsense of the world and all of these grown perspectives. Mm -hmm. So you actually, you brought something to my attention, man, but that's a fact. And, and faith is not religion. And religion is more on the behavior side, going through the mundane, the the, the logistics of, of, of church, yeah. whereas faith and spirituality is something that's not bound by any of the walls. It's not bound by any one person. And that is definitely something to consider because we get caught up so much in the behavior that in times like now where there's COVID and you can't express your behavior and your, 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 your uh, animations, it's just you and God. As it should be, because you don't have the crowd hyping you. You can't crowd and do your normal backflip. You know what I mean? Looking like the Olympics. Right now, it's strictly about us and God individually, collectively, yeah. and all of that nonsense has been taken out of the equation. I believe that was God's doing as well. That and granted, crazy. I know that nobody's perfect, and I actually heard TD Jake say this. He said that you can't expect mm. me because you got to think about you talking about me as a little child my mind can't think but so big yeah you can't expect for me to respect the pastor that you're coming home talking about in front of me oh and um it, oh. you know Ooh. You know, Ooh. words so words. It's, we, we ain't even get on track that's on track those are words i got something else for you yeah. like today for an example in the hospital today i knew that my child was watching me and yeah yeah, 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 yeah. And so even though as irritated and as frustrated as I was, I never, I was like, you know what? I'm not, she's already nervous. Mm -hmm. Okay. She's already, Zion, when it comes to me, she's like, I don't want to bother you, mommy. I'm like, I'm your mama. Okay. So I didn't want her to feel like, oh, my mama's up here. I'm putting pressure on her. She's got the Taylor talk. I kept it so cool. I, I kept it so, I pulled out my book. I was reading my book, and I noticed she would just look over at me from time to time. She would ask me, you okay? I was like, yeah, I'm good. You okay? Yeah, yeah I'm okay. They're taking long. I said, yeah, but something's happening. It must be for a reason, and somebody in the hospital may be sick, something. So me and you are good. Your procedure's small. Somebody, may It's the words that I was using that was making her sit and say, oh, okay. You know what I mean? And, and and I thought about that. And I, at that moment, I was just like, okay, that's something that I picked up from my mother that was one of the good things. Because my mother is always so. Yeah, Diane don't move, bro. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you look over and she's reading the word. And she, you know, she's praying or she's. So that's, that's something that I want to keep in my family with my children and their children. And I want the girls in my family to be that same way where. My mother brings a calmness. She brings about a peace. I just learned that because I'm breaking generational curses and that anxiety that's always that was always on my life and that had my mind running or had me thinking maybe the doctor don't like us. That's why they take it so long. I, I knew she didn't like me. She didn't come. You know what I mean? All of those that 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 I, I've been able to break through that and it feels so good. I'm just hangry. <laughs> that's all but other than that we're gonna get you fed pretty okay, girl okay. but but real dope though that demonstration you showed princess today is frustrating and is trying as it may have been is going to teach her more about patience and composure than anything that comes out your mouth because we tell people things, we use our words to paint these pictures, but your demonstration speaks louder. So you could tell her, don't let that rile you up. Don't let that get you upset. Don't let that get you off your throne, you know, so on and so forth. But seeing you remain calm in that atmosphere and then translating over to her is a powerful demonstration. And at the end of the day, Proverbs, what is it, 18, 21, life and death is in the power of the tongue. Yeah. And you will eat the fruit thereof. And I meditated on that today. And you, life and death is in the power of the tongue. And you will eat the fruit thereof. Not the person you're saying it to. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. And you will eat the fruit thereof. So therefore, when you say something harmful to somebody and you're cursing them, it may hurt and sting for a season. But that curse that you are eating the fruit thereof in your life could last a lifetime and manifest in so many areas of your life. So... You wonder why your business isn't thriving 
but you keep speaking death and negativity over your competitor who you envious of. You wonder why your marriage is in shambles and your marriage can't grow and your husband just won't talk and he won't open up. But you putting your mouth on every single lady at church or at the nail salon or at the eyebrow place about their relationship because life and death are in the power of the tongue and you will eat the fruit thereof. And sitting at that scripture today, it slapped me left and right, so on and so forth, but just realizing... Because we love to tell people, oh, that's part of our culture, too. We got the weirdest tradition. Now I'm going to let them know what's on my mind. Now I'm going to get that off my chest. Now I'm going to slide. Yeah. Go ahead and slide. And and uh, uh, karma going to slide on you. And it's never at the time when you prepare. And it's never in the area you wish to be tested. So just remember, we will eat the fruit thereof. So as you think you're tearing that person down, you're hurting that child, you're hurting that man, you're hurting somebody else, that, that return of investment on what you're saying compounded on yourself is not something that you want to deal with and you are prepared for. Wow. Yeah.